Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining Interview with the Experts podcast. This is Kyle Clarich, and I'm a professor of cardiology in Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm joined today by Dr. Robert France, a cardiologist and professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine as well. He is the director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Clinic and has been on the staff uh, for just one year longer than I, and I'm not going to tell any of you what that is, <laughs> no, since 1990. He's a world expert in the uh, treatment of patients with advanced heart failure and also is, of course, pertinent to this podcast, an expert in the human dynamic assessment, human dynamic studies of patients with pulmonary hypertension. He's run a number of trials um, in pulmonary hypertension over the years, and I think he's very appropriate to help us with this interesting topic of the latest developments in the treatment of pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary arterial hypertension to be accurate. And uh, with that, I want to welcome Bob to the podcast. Kyle, thanks so much. It's really great to be here and an extremely exciting time in our field of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So thanks for the opportunity. Of course. Well, it's, I think our audience will also find it interesting and there's been so much advancement. Uh, can you tell us about what you think the most new and exciting treatments in pulmonary arterial hypertension are that all of our listeners should be aware of? Well, you know, Kyle, when we think about this field, we started many years ago with the approval of IV epoprostenol, which is a prostaglandin continuously infused through a Hickman catheter that turned out to improve survival over a couple of months compared to not receiving that therapy when this drug was first studied. And Subsequently, that's been the most important form of therapy we've had, but extremely intrusive in terms of needing indwelling lines and having a lot of side effects of diarrhea, headache, nausea, leg aching, uh, and so forth. So that a relatively cumbersome therapy. And despite that, there was still ongoing right heart failure and premature death in these patients who often are quite young in the prime of their lives, um, two-thirds women versus men, so many young women with young children and families, and suddenly they're overwhelmed by this problem of pulmonary vascular remodeling and right heart failure. Um, and for years, I've gone to the scientific symposia and heard really smart people like Dr. Marlene Rabinovich from Stanford talk about all the vascular pathways and proliferative aspects and inflammation and all of these kinds of things that we understand from animal models of pulmonary vascular disease, but we've not really been able to apply that to patients with PAH. And there were some failed attempts to do so, um, it, in, including the use of imatinib, which, of course, as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, has sort of revolutionized the therapy of some forms of cancer and seemed to have good efficacy in PAH, but then in the clinical trials ended up causing some increased GI side effects, some fluid retention, and in people on anticoagulation, there were some cerebral bleeds, and so it never really made it to market, even though for that indication, even though it substantially reduced pulmonary pressures and resistance. But that was sort of the opening of a crack in the door that allowed development of other drugs that are somewhat similar in their characteristics that are not vasodilators, but are anti-proliferative. And so this concept of actually, instead of just relaxing the blood vessels and lungs, actually maybe reverse remodeling them, what we might think of as disease-modifying therapies, which may like think about rheumatoid arthritis, is really exciting. And so the first of these was approved by the FDA for use in group one pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, called uh, Sotatercept. Uh, the trade name Winrever, and and this Sotatercept is basically a sub-Q injection once every three weeks, so quite simple. And over months to six months, it will gradually bring down the PA pressure, 
bring down the pulmonary vascular resistance, improve right heart function, reduce NT pro BNP, improve quality of life, improve six minute walk distance. And those clinical trials were published back to back one year apart in the New England Journal of Medicine, including the phase two study, which is unusual for New England Journal, but it was so positive and so dogma changing that it actually merited publication in New England Journal. So that is now available and we're treating a lot of our patients with this therapy who may be on other pH therapies, but not at goal. And it's really having a dramatic impact on their lives and on their pulmonary hypertension. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, so you really have seen a, a breakthrough drug in, in, the, in the recent history of primary pulmonary hypertension. And it's just, um, it's mind boggling how many steps and years we had to go through to get to that. Well, what a great breakthrough. So congratulations to the whole field of pulmonary hypertension with this new breakthrough. And you mentioned it's, um, I'm going to stumble on the name here, but Sotatercept? Yeah, Sotatercept, S-O-T-A-T-E-R-C-E-P-T. And it's basically a, a growth factor in af active in scavengers, so kind of a chimeric molecule that, that circulates and scavenges growth factors that then rebalances the sort of balance between proliferation and anti-proliferation in the circulation. So we know there's sort of deficiencies in BMPR2 signaling in patients with pH, and, and this seems to allow this to be rebalanced. And, and it, the thing is, we, we don't have the ability really to do a lung biopsy in these patients. It's just too risky. They tend to bleed. And, and so we don't actually have a way to directly say what's happening in the pulmonary vasculature. But since it's not a vasodilator and in animal models, it's clearly having antiproliferative effects. We believe that's what's happening is that basically it's causing probably favoring apoptosis and sort of regression of smooth muscle cell hypertrophy and may have anti-inflammatory effects as well. An interesting thing about it is that if you look at NT pro B and P levels, they're starting to come down w within a month or so of starting. So we had this idea it's going to take six months for it to do anything. But actually, when you look at the data, things are happening fairly early and, and may suggest either that there's an anti-inflammatory effect that explains these early effects, um, or that maybe apoptosis and cell turnover and regression happens quicker than we might expect. You think about how quickly our cells in our skin turn over or something, that if, if you suddenly do something that's putting a check on proliferation, maybe that apoptotic process is happening fairly quickly. And the other thing that's interesting about it is that it makes hemoglobin go up. Um, and that we have to monitor because if it goes up too much, we worry about risk of thrombosis. And so for the first five doses, patients have to have blood work done a week before to make sure the hemoglobin is not too high and occasionally makes the platelets drop. So there is a monitoring aspect of it that is fairly labor intensive for our nurses and team, but that increase in hemoglobin can maybe actually is part of the benefit. It's clearly not the whole benefit, but you can imagine a patient with scleroderma and some tendency to GI blood loss who's got a hemoglobin of 10. And if you push that hemoglobin to 12 or 13 or 14 with this drug, that oxygen carrying capacity um, may even be part of the benefit. So it's, it may be kind of a, a sort of sort of a serendipity that it makes hemoglobin go up, which could be a good thing in our patients. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing the mechanism for go the hemoglobin going up is probably unknown, but it's a very interesting uh, mechanism. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, I guess it could be the new blood doping for the Tour de France or something. Probably hard. <laughs> <laughs> kind of not. It's pretty expensive to, to do that. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, that bring you. Know, you mentioned it's a sub Q injection. Is that a daily, weekly, monthly? How often are these patients? Right. It's, it's sort of a, a funny time frame. It's every three weeks. It'd be nicer yeah. if once a month be a little simpler, but it's every three weeks. And and so there there's sets of of nurses that go out from the third party pharmacies and teach patients how to mix up the medication and administer it. And and so uh, part of the logistics there is if they get a dose, then two weeks later they need a blood test to make sure that the blood counts are okay. We need to get that blood test back, review it, and say go ahead and ship them the next dose, and then that's got to get there 
And so it makes it kind of a little bit of a scramble, but essentially it's every three weeks and, and, um, it's very simple for patients really to, to learn to self-administer it. So it's, yeah. and it's, and we're learning now what it might mean for the ability to maybe start to withdraw some of the more intrusive therapies, you know, the patients who have a lot of prostanoid side effects from the oral or the parenteral prostaglandins, that some of the patients were finding that were able to start backing off on the dose of their infused prostanoid. And and then they have fewer side effects from prostanoids. And I think that might be part of the quality of life benefits too. And, and if we can make their lives simpler, the holy grail would be patients for whom we can actually withdraw completely their prostanoid therapy and maintain them with a program of simpler oral agents like PD-5 inhibitors and endothelin receptor antagonists, which are generally well tolerated and maybe use less than way the prostanoids in terms of longitudinal management. So basically with this new Cetaroset and its ability to cause anti-proliferative effects in the pulmonary circulation and even the um, anti-inflammatory effects potentially in the blood going and the uh, hemoglobin going up, then you're actually getting to the point where you can back off on other therapies. So right, and I, I think maybe we'll. I I remember recently, like within a month or so of having the drug available, I saw a new patient with heritable or familial pulmonary arterial hypertension, a, a young woman like in her twenties, and you know, usually we'd be thinking, okay, we're going to do our best, but this is going to be really difficult. And maybe in 10 or 20 years, we'll be looking at lung transplant or something if things don't work, you know. And I, I said to this patient, you know, for the first time ever, I believe we're in a situation where we should be able to manage your disease for many decades uh, with therapies that are going to be less intrusive, less side effect prone. And maybe prevent the need to use these more aggressive, not more aggressive, but more side effect prone and more cumbersome therapies, you know. And so I, I feel like the first patients getting these drugs were predominantly ones that were starting to fail everything we had, where it was either do this or you're going to have a lung transplant or you're not going to survive. And and now we're working back a little bit more that where should the role be? And actually the the World Symposium guidelines that are just sort of published this year after after the the World Symposium on pH that occurred earlier this year in, in, in Barcelona um, are kind of talking about this in terms of having the option of using this drug instead of prostanoids potentially in those patients that are sort of intermediate risk and for the high risk ones, giving them everything we've got and then adding this on top of it and then maybe being able to withdraw later. So um, it's an incredible time. And I, when patients are freaked out by Googling pulmonary arterial hypertension, now I can say we really have something fundamentally better. And it's, if you're going to have this illness, it's the best time ever to have it because we can really treat it. And it sounds like maybe the future developments that I was going to ask you about, one of them may be that the Cetaroset is going to be actually a first-line drug. Well, that, I think that, is that what you're alluding to. I, I was, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like it, it could be, and I think that one of the barriers to that right now is just the expense, because as a first-in-class drug for a rare disease, you know, the the, the price is is very high, and so, and, and you know, we're we're getting, of course, uh, the the usual issue of prior authorizations, and do you have to prove that you failed or not adequately yeah. responded to simpler things first? Um, so. I think that that will come with time, and I think we'll have to to learn exactly how how that's that's going to go. And uh, you know, I say like any drug, it's not perfect, right? I mean, it has the sort of unanticipated effect of causing cutaneous telangiectasias, mm-hmm. um, and they almost look like cherry angiomas, a little different from the typical telangiectasias you might see in scleroderma. But up at six months, up to almost 20% of patients may develop some of these skin vascular telangiectasias, and that may be associated with a little bit increased risk of of GI bleeds and things like that. So it's possible that it's not going to be a forever drug for everybody with minimal side effects. 
But the exciting part about that is that there's another drug in the pipeline currently in phase three studies uh, called serolutinib, so not sotaterosep, but serolutinib, which is a designer drug that's inhaled. And so you can imagine that concept of avoiding off-target effects by targeting the lungs directly with an inhaled product where there are detectable levels in the blood, but they're not all that high. And so we feel that with this form of therapy, a drug like serolutinib that's in phase three studies, that it also is an anti-proliferative that dropped pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary pressure in the phase two studies um, may be a targeted therapy so that if we start to have issues of off-target effects of something like sotaterosept, maybe we could transition to this, or maybe they're even additive where you use one on top of the other. So it's a, a great time to be in the pH space, and I'm really excited about what the years ahead are going to bring. And, I, and I'm pretty much assuming that at, at this stage, it's, these drugs are still pretty much uh, a subspecialty clinic uh, would need to be involved where you have all the nursing support, the subspecialty pharmacy support, et cetera. Right. I, I think that's that's certainly the way it, it is right now. And and our nurses really have to be on top of things where they have scores of patients now who every few weeks are having blood work done and have to get that turned around. And we have to look at it and make sure their, their hemoglobin is not too high and that they're not having any bleeding issues. And so it is kind of one of those things where we're fortunate to have the nursing and the support that we do to be able to sort of deliver a care package. And then when the patients call and they say, gosh, now I've got more prostanoid side effects and headaches where we almost see like, I feel like it's almost like you have a car where you got your foot on the gas going up a hill. When you go over the crest of the hill, you don't take your foot off the gas, you know, where if you're on this really potent vasodilator combination, and then you start to drop the pulmonary resistance, I think we're like almost over revving the system. Um, because it seems like they they complain, saying that I'm having more headache, I'm having more flushing, and then we start backing down the prostanoid. Now, if, although that is true, there's also this funny thing that it doesn't seem to increase cardiac output. So if you look at cardiac output, it's about the same. And all of our other drugs, it's it's like completely unexpected. You think a drug that's dropping pulmonary resistance, the RV works better, the cardiac output's going to go up. But it actually doesn't seem that it does that, you know. So it's like people are scrambling around trying to understand that. So, and that may have something to do with the hemoglobin going up and maybe not needing increased output in terms of oxygen carrying capacity and delivery. Um, but anyway, that people are sort of really thinking hard about why that's different from our other vasodilator drugs. Wow, it's fascinating. A lot of really fascinating physiology and basic science that's going into really improved patient outcomes. So that's fantastic news. Uh, so it seems like, well, you've taught me a lot. I don't live in the space of pulmonary hypertension and I learned about uh, cetaterosept now and that uh, we can, we've can we got another uh, two or three drugs coming down the pipeline that uh, could a- advance therapies even better and that we're talking about disease modification after all this time. So it's very exciting. Well, thanks for the chance to talk about this, uh, Val. And, and we're happy to see these patients, pulmonary arterial hypertension, and, and are all really excited to be able to help them in ways that we never even dreamed of 20 years ago. Yeah, that's great. Well, congratulations and thank you for all the you know, research and studies and clinical trials that you've been involved with to advance this field. Well, um, if I'll leave you with any last comments you might want to make, and then otherwise we'll sign off of our podcast. All right. Thanks so much, Kyle, for the opportunity and and um, just really excited for what the years ahead will bring in this space. I second that. Thank you, Bob. Have a good day.